On November 22, 1971, Bill Campbell, a navigator with the search and rescue helicopter flight covering the Cairngorm region in the Scottish Highlands, was a part of a small crew that was tasked with flying into a blizzard. The outside temperature gauge was indicating negative 10 degrees Celsius, or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. The small crew's eyes scanned the vast white landscape, looking for any color amongst the plain white. But there was nothing but strong winds and heavy snowfall. They had to reduce the speed of the helicopter due to the intense turbulence and flew at about 40 knots or 46 miles per hour. The group was exhausted as they had been up all night and been preparing for this rescue since 1.30 a.m. after they had found out that a group of eight, including six teens, had been missing somewhere in the vast landscape, fighting against a blizzard for their lives. Over 50 individuals were looking for the group using any methods they could, but so far, nobody had made any progress. As the men flew through the storm on instruments alone, Bill would hear from a fellow member, contact 10 o'clock. John Kennedy, the pilot, would immediately make a right turn into the wind, and the men would see what they all thought was a red tint in the distance. But as they flew closer, the tent suddenly sprouted arms and began to wave. It was a girl, and she was crawling through waist-deep snow, hardly able to move her body. But when they finally did reach her, she could only utter three words. Faye Boudet buried burn. The men did not know it at the time, but their discovery would change mountaineering forever. And as they learned of the events that had occurred over the previous two days, many lives would be changed. This is their story. Before we dive into today's video, I wanted to put a disclaimer as this tragedy covers serious and real events that happen to teenagers. Viewer discretion is advised. The Cairngorms are a mountainous region of Scotland that was established as a national park in September of 2003. The central area is a remote high granite plateau at about 1,200 meters, consisting of many long glacial valleys running north to south. Between two valleys, the plateau extends to the summit of the two most famous peaks in the area, the namesake of the region, Cairngorm Mountain, which overlooks Aviemore, the main town in the area, and on the other side, at 1,309 meters, Ben Macdui, the tallest mountain of the region and the second highest peak in all the British Isles. The edges of the plateau are steep cliffs of granite that many tourists and avid outdoorsmen ski, rock, and ice climb. To this day, the area remains very remote, with few roads or trails expanding through the vast landscape. This has attracted people who want to explore its beauty, but there are risks and in 1971, they were magnified compared to today. The main concern with the area is the weather conditions, or the unpredictability of the weather. The height, distance, and severe climate create a serious challenge to plan any long-term expedition. Snow can fall at any time during the year and snow patches persist in the area all summer. In fact, it is so cold that the area is technically a subarctic climate, which simply means there are long, cold winters and short, cool summers. The climate is more similar to the high ground in the Arctic regions of Canada or Norway than the European Alps. But we have cold climates all over our planet. That doesn't necessarily make a region dangerous. What is different on the Cairngorm Plateau is the severity at which the weather can change. The weather often deteriorates rapidly with elevation. So even when there are moderate conditions below the plateau, 150 meters higher on the top, the weather is vastly different. Storms and mist rage around anyone braving to take on the climate. You are stepping on ice patches and powdery snow is falling all around you, making it difficult to see. Even when no snow is falling, the wind can whip up the powder on the ground to produce whiteout conditions for a few meters above the surface. And snow drifts can build up rapidly in sheltered places. Gravel can be blown through the air, making walking nearly impossible. The barren wasteland has such an extreme climate that a record wind speed of 173 miles per hour was measured at the summit weather station. 
For reference, this would equate to a category 5 hurricane or an EF 4 to 5 tornado. For both of those natural events, that is the most dangerous and violent rating of their category. Even people who have traveled the Antarctic and climbed the Himalayas have said that the Cairngorm Plateau can be as dangerous as some of the most extreme parts of the world. The locals have spent generations adapting to the sudden weather changes and trying to find ways to cope. Across the area you can find small stone buildings originally built for farm workers called Abathi. Nowadays, they mainly provide shelter for anybody who is walking the highlands and may need to escape the severe weather. Some of these buildings have basic equipment and an area to make a fire, but some are simply stone that is designed to protect you from the harsh conditions outside. Although there are several of these buildings spread throughout the Cairngorm Plateau, one of the highest is known as the Kuranbathi. Although it does have a chimney for a fire, it is a tiny building standing at 4 meters by 2 meters, and this shelter is often used as a last resort by anyone crossing the plateau. The Cairngorm Plateau expedition would be made up of 14 teenagers and two adults from a large secondary school in Edinburgh called Ainsley Park. The expedition would be spearheaded by Ainsley Park's 23-year-old outdoor education teacher, Ben Beatty. Catherine Murray Brown, a six-year student at the school in 1971, would state the following when talking about Ben. He was a popular teacher. He was very gregarious and very outgoing, and up until that point had never done anything particularly controversial. Catherine would also state it wasn't an unusual thing for the school to partake in outdoor education trips, and there was just this idea that people went off on something that was meant to be great fun and really enjoyable and really good. Although Ben had taken students almost every Friday to camp, walk, and explore the wilderness, in November of 1971, he wanted to do something more ambitious. Ben had a lot of experience in the mountains, but he had never hiked the Cairngorm Plateau in winter, and he would need a partner who knew their way around the environment, so he enlisted the help of his 20-year-old girlfriend, Catherine Davis. Catherine, otherwise known as Kathy, was a student at Doomfordline College of Education and she had been walking the hills since she was 14 and began climbing in the area at 16. She also had advanced qualifications from the Scottish Mountaineering Club and had completed three winter hikes over the plateau, making her the ideal person to help Ben. After Ben suggested it to the school, everyone thought it was a great idea and soon they had the approval. The plan was for the two adults to take a group of 14 students from Ainsley Park's Mountaineering Club to Langlia, the town's new outdoor center near the city of Avamore. There, they would meet up with the final adult of the expedition, an 18-year-old who was a temporary member of the Langlia staff named Sheila Sunderland. In the weeks leading up to the expedition, the school would make emergency rescue officials aware of what was to take place. Additionally, the school would send home permission slips with each child that their parents had to sign off on. But these permission slips didn't tell the full story. Many of the parents thought this would be a routine trip to Langlia and a short hike around the building. What they weren't aware of is that this would be a winter expedition through the Cairngorm Plateau. Although the parents weren't fully informed, it was still the school's primary concern to ensure the students had the proper gear and clothes for the expedition. Because they only planned to be gone for two days, each student was equipped with basic supplies for one night. This includes mountaineering items like carabiners, which would help secure ropes, harnesses, and a stove for cooking. They were also given sleeping bags meant for extreme weather, large tarps for emergency shelters, and a basic first aid kit. Additionally, because this was 1971, there was no tracking devices or satellite phones like today, meaning the only way anyone knew if there was an issue was when a group would fail to reach their rendezvous point. The group underwent significant training in the weeks leading up to the expedition. Ben taught the 14 teenagers a series of mountaineering techniques such as ascending and descending steep slopes, how to climb through rock and ice patches, how to slide down icy slopes safely, and of course, how to self-arrest if they were to fall. This is a technique used to stop yourself from an uncontrollable slide. Finally, each member of the group went through a series of basic comprehensive first aid training that included special attention to cold environments with issues such as frostbite. The students were also shown what to do in an emergency situation, in particular, 
how to navigate using a compass in conditions such as a whiteout. This training was crucial to the expedition, and it plays a pivotal role later in the story. Because of the training leading up to the expedition, it became clear that six members of the group were not as capable as the rest of the party due to the lack of experience with high elevation hikes. Because of this, a plan was put together that would split the teenagers into two groups. The first group would be led by Ben and made up of eight teenagers who had been on different trips with him before. The other six less experienced members would be led by Kathy and Sheila on a more simple route. The plan was for both groups to start at the outdoor center and follow the same route on day one, with the experienced group leading, and the less experienced following close behind. After enjoying a meal together and preparing for the long trip, they would leave the outdoor center and climb up the road to a parking lot. At midday, they would set out from the parking lot before passing through several different areas, including the plateau, and finally reaching the top of Ben Macdui. After reaching the summit, they would descend the peak following a shallow stream all the way to Kor Bothy their shelter for the night. On day two, the inexperienced group would follow the plateau back right away, while the experienced group would head out to climb Britain's third and fourth highest peaks before following the plateau back as well. Around 4.30 p.m. on the 21st, they would all meet up at Rothy Murchis's Bailey's Metal Bridge, near the foot of the Cairngorm, where the two groups would ride back to the outdoor center, concluding their expedition. This was plan A, Ben and Kathy had also come up with a plan B because they knew how dangerous the Cairngorms could be. If the weather turned bad, both teams would skip the climb of Ben Macdui instead, heading for the small current shelter at the top of the plateau called Kuran Bathi. Here, they would wait out the bad weather before exiting through the lower pass together. After everyone had been informed of the plan and it was signed off on, Ben and Kathy prepared to take the excited teenagers on their trip. On the morning they were set to depart, they checked the weather forecast and there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary for that time of year. But what Ben and Kathy didn't realize was that a cold northwesterly stream of air had been blowing across most of Scotland that week. Many of the high roads were already covered in snow, making it impossible for anyone to get around the area quickly. This had an impact on the group right away, as they couldn't use the road to reach the restaurant at Cairn Gorm, which was supposed to be their starting point. Instead, they would have to take a ski lift to the top, which meant that they would depart on their trek a little later than they had originally planned. Once they did reach the top, they would quickly eat lunch and set off around 1 p.m., over an hour after their original start time. Ben's more experienced group would leave first, and the less experienced group would set out behind them about 20 minutes later. Almost immediately after the two groups had set out, the weather began to turn. A mile into their trek, a blizzard-like wind began blowing around the group, causing snow to be lifted all around them. They were now trying to navigate in a total whiteout. Nobody could see more than a few meters in front of their faces. So they stopped, pulled out a rope, and all of the teenagers attached themselves to Ben and each other. At this point, it became obvious they would have to move to plan B. They would all start making their way towards Kuran Bathi immediately. It was a difficult trip, and the entire time they were fighting against the snow that swirled around them. But after two and a half hours, at 3.30 p.m., they had found the shelter. Once they reached the Bothy, they would have to dig out the entrance as it was completely blocked by the snow, a testament to how bad the weather had become after a few hours. As the group began to warm up inside, the hours passed, and there was no sign of the inexperienced group. Ben would assume that they had found shelter in some other Bothy on the path, or at least that is what he hoped for. The next morning, the group woke up and began preparing to make the trip back. They dug out their shelter, but the weather showed no signs of improving, so the group knew it was going to be a long day. Normally, they would have stayed within the Bothy and waited out the storm, but remember, they had prepared for a short trip, so they were quickly running out of supplies. It was not possible for the group to go back the way they came through the upper plateau, so instead, they would need to descend into a lower pass. But this came with risks, because they would have to rappel down a steep cliff, 
One by one, each member would slowly make their way down the cliff, with Ben helping along the way. One of the boys would slip in the cold, and Ben would quickly reach out and grab him, stopping his fall. Thankfully, this was the only incident that took place during their descent. The group would slowly continue their trip back to safety, eventually reaching a hut that had some basic supplies, where Ben would radio the outdoor center and let them know what had occurred. At 5.30 p.m., Ben and his group would reach the bridge they were supposed to rendezvous with Kathy at, but there was a problem. They weren't there. Ben would quickly check the restaurant and the outdoor center, but there was still no sign of her group. This was a problem because Kathy's group had set out behind Ben's and they should have certainly made it back before his. This meant that something was wrong and Ben would quickly notify rescue officials at this point. On the previous day after Ben's group had set out on their trek, Kathy waited 20 minutes before her group of inexperienced climbers would set out following in the previous group's footsteps. Sometime later, Kathy's group were spotted from the base plateau, heading directly towards the storm clouds. As the blizzard hit, the group made the decision to descend lower into the valley in an attempt to get away from the whiteout conditions. But it didn't work. They would push forward, looking for the Quran Bathi, but instead would find the lake that was near their shelter. By the time they found the lake, the snow and wind were more intense than it had ever been. This meant the water was frozen and completely covered, making it difficult to recognize specifically where the group was. Kathy knew that the shelter was out there, and it had to be close, but she had no idea how to find it. She was out of options. In a last ditch effort, Kathy would instruct her group to bivouac at their current location in an attempt to escape the conditions. What Kathy didn't know was that they couldn't have picked a worse spot to set up camp. They were at a place called Fay Boudet, and it was a natural trap for drifting snow. This also meant they were just a few hundred feet away from the Kuran Bathi. The group would initially try to build a shelter out of the snow but it was too powdery to make anything stable. So instead, they tried to build a snow wall to protect them from the wind. By the time this was complete, most of their clothes were soaked. Because of this, the teenagers would take off their wet clothes and huddle in their sleeping bags together as the snow continued to fall on them. Initially, this helped, and they tried to keep morale high by telling jokes and singing, but the weather was not stopping anytime soon. Soon, some of the teenagers began panicking and screaming at Kathy for help. The snow was falling as quickly as they could shake it off and filling their mouths. Some thought they were choking as their sleeping bags rapidly covered with snow. As darkness came, Kathy spent most of the night attempting to dig the children out of the snow. She would kick the snow off over and over until it became so thick that she began using her bare hands. Eventually, she would lose her gloves as she frantically tried to keep the teenagers' heads above the surface. She tried as best she could, but the snow didn't stop, and night only made it worse. When morning came on the 21st, Kathy could hear shouting from one of the boys who was buried beneath the snow. By the time she dug him out, another student had already become half buried. The other adult in the group, Sheila, and another girl were in bad shape as they were both in a daze and in the final stages of hypothermia. In severe cases of hypothermia, your body actually feels very warm, almost like a burning sensation. This is why many people who suffer severe hypothermia begin taking off their clothes thinking they are hot, when in reality, this is a death sentence. Kathy was horrified to find that two girls had taken off their clothes and were outside of their sleeping bags on top of the snow. Another student, William, would help Kathy get the girls back into the sleeping bags, but this was the final straw. The camp was in chaos, and Kathy decided that she had to get help or everyone was going to die. Kathy and the strongest member of the group, William, would set off into the storm, but almost immediately have to turn back around because of the strong wind. There was nothing they could do but continue to huddle in their sleeping bags and try to protect themselves from the cold. The following morning, almost everyone in the group had been covered by the falling snow. Kathy could hear voices shouting from below her in the snow, but as time went on, the voices got quieter and quieter. 
Kathy and William would set off again, but almost immediately, William would collapse from exhaustion. Kathy, in a move of complete desperation, would resort to crawling on her hands and knees through the waist-deep snow. Sergeant John Duffy was visiting friends when he got the call at midnight that there were missing hikers on the Cairngorm Plateau. As leader of the mountain rescue team, this isn't uncommon, but what made this call different was that it was six teenagers and two adults. By 3 a.m., the rescue team's snow track vehicle was on its way up the valley towards Korobathi, which was the intended location for the group to seek shelter. But it was empty, which John knew meant that the group had spent two nights outdoors in sub-zero temperatures. The following day, on Monday, November 22nd, a search party of over 50 individuals, including police mountain rescue teams and helicopters, was underway. One of these helicopters was carrying navigator Bill Campbell, and Bill and his fellow rescue operators had been awake all night, covering a game plan for the search. But the weather had made it very difficult. They had spent hours checking all the Bothies in the area, but to this point, they had found nothing. It wasn't until 9.30 a.m. that one of the crew members spotted a bright red tent, or what they thought was a tent. But as the helicopter got closer, the tent would raise its arms, and they realized it was Kathy, who had been crawling on her hands and knees. The rescue helicopter had trouble getting close to Kathy because each time it got close to the ground, the rotors would spit up the white snow, causing a whiteout, making it impossible to see anything. They tried three separate times to land, but couldn't. And knowing there was a cloud storm coming their way, the helicopter would drop two rescue officials about 70 yards away from Kathy in an area that wasn't covered in deep snow. After the two men reached her, they realized she was utterly exhausted. She was in a state of total collapse, and it was practically impossible to drag her through the waist-deep snow. Because the helicopter could not get close to the group, they were left with one option. Bill would drop out of the hatch with the helicopter winch in tow, and use it to help guide the pilot to Kathy. The wind was rocking the helicopter back and forth, but eventually they were able to hover the front wheels right on top of the snow, with the cabin floor sitting at shoulder height. They struggled to get Kathy on board, but after they did, the helicopter would return to the original drop-off location to pick up the remaining rescue operators. Kathy was suffering from advanced stages of hypothermia and had frozen solid, severely frostbitten hands. Mentally, she was confused, but was just able to tell the crew three words, Faye Boudet, buried, burn, which was enough for the rescue crew. They would radio back to John Duffy, who immediately would send out another helicopter to see if they could find the missing teenagers from above, but the weather made that nearly impossible. It soon became clear that the only way to rescue them would be on foot. Ben Beatty and two other rescue operators would be the first to reach the area, with John and a doctor not far behind. After Ben began digging, they soon found six sleeping bags, but there was no sound or sign of life. In the sleeping bags were five students, and the one adult, Sheila, all of them, lifeless. The seventh sleeping bag was found in the middle of the group, but as they began digging, they saw a boy's hand move. The teenager's name was Raymond, and he was still alive. The group frantically dug him out of the snow, and the doctor immediately began tending to him. Additionally, John would take off his jacket and wrap it around the boy. A helicopter was called, and Raymond was immediately taken to a nearby hospital. After the helicopter left, the group would move the bodies to a location that they felt would not be covered in significant snow. Then, they would place poles next to them, so they could be recovered later after the weather improved, and be reunited with their families. One of the biggest failures of the expedition was the lack of information provided to the parents. On Sunday afternoon, police had gone to the families to let them know that the group was running behind, but it wasn't until reporters started asking the families questions that they quickly learned their kids were missing. Of course, the families would head to the school outraged and worried because they had no idea their kids would be in this type of danger, and the school had done a poor job of informing them. It wasn't until Monday afternoon that they were told that five of the students 
had passed away. After inquiries took place, it was found that all of the teenagers, along with Sheila, had died of hypothermia and severe cold exposure. Many of the parents wanted Ben and the school to be held responsible, but eventually it was ruled that although this was a failure of information, it was still an accident. Regulations would be put into place not only in the Cairngorm, but throughout schools in the country. Parents would be better informed, and school trips would be scrutinized to prevent further accidents from happening. Additionally, better training and a certification regime for instructors would be put in place. Raymond and Kathy would be the only survivors of the second group, and to this day, Raymond still does not speak about that trip. Ben Beatty would continue to work in the mountains, but did pass away from a fall while climbing the Himalayas in 1978. Although potential future accidents could be prevented, this one was not, and the impact it had on the community can never be overlooked.